All right, gang, let's try and unpack what on earth a p-value is. We've been calculating these p-values uh, in step 11 of our 13-step write-up. We always take that number we found in step 10, whether it's a z-score or a t-score, and either use normal CDF or t-CDF to calculate this number. We know it's a probability, right? A p-value, it's always going to be a number between 0 and 1. But let's see if we can figure out or put some more context as to what the p-value represents. So what I want to do is I want to articulate the definition of a p-value. I'm going to give you the formal um, definition. And then on the back page, we're going to run a one sample proportion Z hypothesis test. So this would be a chapter nine type problem. Um, in example one, we're doing something different. Um, we're just going to do it in words. It would technically be called the goodness of fit test, but we haven't gotten to that. That's in chapter 11. So we're just going to do that in words. All right, so here is the official definition of a p-value. So p-value of a hypothesis test, again, the p-value is a probability. So the p-value is the probability of getting the results you did, or potentially more extreme results, through random variation, given that the null is true. All right, so p-value is a probability of getting the results you saw from your, from your sample. So getting the results you saw from your experiment, or potentially even more extreme, just through chance, pending the null was true. So again, in any experiment you have to run, something is going to happen. And the p-value is assessing the likelihood of that something happening pending the null was true. So if the null is true, what's the likelihood that what we saw happen in our experiment would actually happen? All right, so here we go. So we're gonna do a couple of examples. All right, so the first one's gonna involve rolling some dice, games of chances. So we've talked about rolling two die before, but here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna roll some dice and you're gonna assume I'm not lying to you. Right? You're gonna assume that these dice are fair. And then the alternate is gonna be, well, do I have trick dice? All right, so we're gonna assume they're fair dice unless there's enough evidence for these to be trick dice. And I just wanted to remind us of the outcomes if we are rolling two dice. We talked about this back in chapter three. But here we go again. So if you're rolling a dice, the first dice has six outcomes, right? The second dice has six outcomes. So if we use that little multiplication rule, there's 36 possible outcomes when you roll two die. And here they are, right? You can get a one and a one, a one and a two, one and a three, so on and so forth. And this, this breakdown of outcomes and these probabilities over here, these are used in setting up the game uh, called craps. It's a game of chance in in Vegas or any kind of gambling setting. That's where you have two dice and you're rolling it and you have that big old board and you're you're putting numbers on, I, they call it the pass line, and you're betting on hard eight, soft eight, all sorts of um, fun things that way. So as we go through here, I, I want you to take a look at the sum of the two faces of the die. That's something that we um, we typically look at. Um, in many games of chance. So you can see here, um, if I were to add up these two faces, one plus one is two, one plus two is three, right? This would sum to four, five, six, seven. This would be three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on and so forth. And so what I did here is I gave you a probability breakdown if we look at the total between the two dice. So if the sum of the two faces of the die were two, right, one plus one, is the only way to make that happen, and that means that there's a one out of 36 chance of that happening, because that's the only two faces I can have. I have to have a one on the first dice and a one on the second dice in order to have a sum of two. But if we talk about the sum of three, there's two ways to get that. I could roll a one and then a two, or I could roll a two and then a one. And each of these have a one out of 36 chance of happening, so collectively we have a two out of 36 chance at happening, or roughly 6%. If I wanted to roll a four, right, we could get a one and a three, a two and a two, or a three and a one. And you can see the fours right here. They, they go diagonally, these sums, right? So three and one, two and two, one and three, right? To get a five, you can see it's gonna go along this diagonal, right? So I could get a four and a one, a three and a two, a two and a three, a one and a four. And if you look at it, seven, is the most likely roll if you're gonna take, or I should say the most likely total if you're gonna roll two dice because every face can contribute to it. 
A six could get paired with a one, a five could get paired with a two, a four could get paired with a three, and then we have the flip of all those, three, four, two, five, one, six. So this diagonal, this sum here, happens, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, out of 36 times. So when you're rolling two dice, your most likely outcome is a seven. Right? And you can see the more rare outcomes are a two and a 12. There's only one way to get a 12. Next likely, or next least likely are the threes and 11s, right? And then they get more and more likely. And you can see this, this symmetric three, six, eight, 11, 14, 17, 14, 11, eight, six, three, right? You can hear 17 is the midpoint and then everything's symmetric after that. So. If I just had a couple of dice, right, this might go off screen, right, I rolled a five, right, and then there's my seven, which is pretty likely I can keep rolling these, so oh, there's my snake eyes, all right, so what's going to happen is you're going to assume that these die I'm going to roll are fair, and we're going to have the alternate be that they're trick dice, and as we go through this, I'm going to just scooch this down so we have the definition of the p-value in our, in our view, so I can refer back to it. So here we go. I'm going to start to roll dice and we're going to see. All right, we're going to keep in mind what is the probability of getting the results I'm about to get just through chance, just through random variation if the null was true. Okay, so if I had fair dice, how likely is what you're about to see? What's that probability? Okay, here we go. So it's hard to see, but I got an 11. All right, so I got an 11. Okay, great. 11, that had a 6% chance of happening down here, so not super likely, but also not super unlikely. Okay, so 11, great. That could happen just by chance. Okay, I got another 11. All right, again, that could happen. It's possible, right? I got a seven, okay, possible. So you start to think, does this sound like fair dice or trick dice? I got a seven, all right, I got a seven. I got an 11. Oops, you can't see it, but I promise I got a seven. I got an 11. I got an 11. I got an 11. I got a seven. I got an 11. So you hear me saying all of this. Now, if I had fair dice, what is the probability of getting the results I did? So getting 11, 11, I think it was 7, 11, 7, 11, 11, 11, whatever the order was. Just through chance, pending I had fair dice. So let's keep going. All right, 7, 11, 11, 11, 7, 7. And are you starting to form your own opinion? Do you think these are fair die or do you have enough evidence to reject the null. Is it possible, is it technically possible that if I rolled this the, the 15 times I have, that I would only get sevens and elevens? Yes, it is technically possible. Is it probable? What is that p-value? And I, I hope you're starting to feel that it's pretty unlikely. It's It should be weird that all I've been able to roll right now are sevens or elevens, right? And I can keep on going, right? Seven, seven, eleven, 11, 7, and I think you're starting to get the idea, and if you haven't seen it through just, oh, there, the 11, excuse me, if you haven't seen it, these are, well, you decide, do you want to reject and tell me their trick, or do you want to fail to reject and just keep the null that they're fair? I hope you're hearing it or feeling it that these are definitely trick die. You don't roll dice that many times and get only 7s and 11s, and the trick here is that this dice, these are only 6s or 2s. Okay, so that is a trick die, right? And this is only fives. Every face of this die is fives, okay? So that's why I either get a combination of seven or I get a combination of an 11. And I threw you off. I had two other dice here that were the same color that were legit dice. So when I initially rolled those first three rolls before we got into all of this, um, these were legit dice. And if you, you can go on eBay and buy these for about five bucks. Great crowd pleaser. The way to tell the difference, I'm not sure how well it shows up on camera here. These have sort of um, curvy or um, smooth edges, and these are corners. So it's pretty simple to keep track of them if you have them at a party. Um, and I, I've done it many times. It's, it's, a good, it's a good time. All right, so in terms of answering this question, again, we're thinking about the probability of getting results that we did just through chance,
given the null hypothesis was true, the likelihood that I would only roll sevens and elevens is basically zero if I had fair dice, which is why we would reject the null. So based on the die rolls, should we reject or fail to reject the null? Well, we should definitely reject the null, right? Evidence of trick dice. And they were trick dice, right? Before I even revealed that they were trick dice, I would have rejected the null. And we would have found out once I showed you that I did have trick dice that I didn't make a type one error. Okay, great. All right, so the next example we're going to do is going to be a little applet. So I'm going to flip to my computer and we're going to just keep back on this idea of the p value. It's the probability of getting the results you did, right? So what you saw in your experiment, all of our die rolls, just through chance, or we love to use that phrase, random variation, given that the null was true. And again, given that the null was true, the likelihood, the probability of getting only sevens and elevens was basically zero. So it was time to reject the null. I had enough evidence for the alternate. All right, so let's try it with a simulated basketball player throwing free throws. I'll see you in a bit. Bye. Hey, Math43, let's take a look at an applet that'll hopefully um, help solidify what a p-value means. So just to remind ourselves, the p-value of a hypothesis test, it's the probability of getting the results you did, or more extreme results, through random variation given that the null is true. So the p-value, it's a probability of getting the sample data you got, or potentially even more extreme, just through chance, because something has to happen. So what's the likelihood this happens just because? Pending the null is true. Okay, so here are a couple of paragraphs we're gonna read through. This is theory, this is the setup. So a statistical test assesses the evidence provided by data against some claim called the null hypothesis, H sub zero. This applet allows you to gather data until you are ready to reach a conclusion about the truth of the null hypothesis. It illustrates the reasoning of tests. Right? Are the data compatible with the claim or are they evidence against it? Um, so here we go. The basketball team at State University claims that each of their players make 80% of his free throws. That's a null hypothesis and is represented by this horizontal blue line on the graph. Have players try shooting free throws and see whether or not you think this null can be rejected. So the hypotheses that we're going to test out are um, what they claim, that the true proportion of free throws that a player makes is 80% against the two-sided alternate. When I read through this, there wasn't really a slant one way or the other. I think just through um, what, just through basketball, the nature of basketball, we would be more suspicious of less than 80%. We probably wouldn't get upset if somebody made more than 80% of their free throws and they claimed 80%. Uh, but I didn't see the slant either way, so I just went with the not equals to alternate. And we're going to simulate this and decide do we want to reject or fail to reject the, the null. Um, so. Uh, we're going to ask a state university player to shoot free throws by clicking that green button that says shoot. All right, you can see it over here. You can get more data by clicking shoot repeatedly. Do the data appear to agree with the 80% claim or to give evidence against it? When you're satisfied, click show true probability and see the truth for this player. All right, so let's see. I, I'm going to, I just arbitrarily said let my sample size be 50. So I'm going to ask this player to go up to the free throw line and take 50 shots. So let's see what we got here. Let's shoot. All right, and you can see this other blue line is the relative frequency. So this player, not doing super hot just yet. All right, we're at, well, he's up to 50%. So we're just gonna watch this play out. And you can see that relative frequency, that sample proportion, you can see how close is it getting to the null proportion, what, what, the, this, what State University is claiming. Oh, the guy's getting closer. Okay, so, 66%. So here we go. The p-value. It's the probability of getting the results you did, so 66%, or potentially more extreme, just through chance, just through random variation alone, given that the null is true. Now when it says, or more extreme, since this number was below the, um, the claim of 80%, we mean what's the likelihood of getting um, a sample proportion of 66% or less, right, because we would be doing the left tail of that because its z-score would be negative. Um, just through chance alone. Well, so let, let's take a step back. If, if this player really makes his free throws 80% of the time, what's the likelihood, what's the probability that we caught him on a day where he only made 66%? Uh, I think that likelihood's pretty low. That's a gap of 14%, right? What we were claiming 
or you know what the state university was claiming and what we saw um, I don't think it's very likely that would happen by chance if the null was actually true I have a feeling this player's true proportion is closer to like 60 or 70 percent right it's a little bit lower and then he would be in that band between 60 and 70 and shoot 66 percent and if you weren't sure you could ask this player to shoot more but I think this is enough for me to reject the null so if I hit show true probability yeah see that makes more sense to me that really this guy shoots his free throws or makes his free throws 66 percent of the I'm sorry 60 percent of the time and then on this particular day, he was a little bit on fire and made 66. That seems more likely. That gap is only 6%, right? Where what they claim, the 80 to 66, that's a gap of 14%. That seemed a little too far off for me. Now, let's just run this on our calculator to see what our calculator would have done. So let me do stat test 5. All right, and let me move this over. Whenever the enter key is on my little face button or face window, it won't let me do it. So we had 80%. And how many did we make? We made 33 out of 50. And we had the not equals to alternate. All right. So the p-value here would have told us to reject the null, which we did anyways, right? I said 66% is just too far off from 80%. And we can see the probability of getting this sample proportion of 33 out of 50 or even more extreme than that, that would only happen 1% of the time just by chance. So that's rare enough for us to say, it's time to reject the null. All right, let's try this again. Now when we go through this, I never know going in, oops, sorry, I want a new shooter. I never know going in if if I should reject or fail to reject. I, I'm in it with you just to see. All right, so let's see how this guy's doing. Ooh, fire, oh, the not on fire. So, this guy's he dipped a little, okay. He's coming around to, he's pretty close to 80%. I have a feeling I'm gonna fail to reject the null unless something extreme happens. Yeah, I'm gonna fail to reject it. Okay, so if the null is true, if this player really makes his free throws 80% of the time and we had sample data of 78%, could that happen just by chance if it was if the null was true? And absolutely, if you shoot, or in my opinion, we'll find out for sure. If you shoot 80% um, of your free throws, I think it's entirely possible that I showed up on a day when you made 78% of them. Now, I still could be wrong, right? So I'm going to fail to reject the null right now. It is possible that I'm making a type 2 error because on the flip of that, well, I do think there's not enough evidence for me to say his free throw percent is different from 80%. It's also possible that this guy's free throw percent was actually 75 and he overshot that day rather than it being 80 and he undershot that day. So there's a possibility of making a type 2 error, but welcome to hypothesis testing. It happens sometimes. But at this point, I'm going to fail to reject the null. There is not enough evidence from this sample data to tell me that the true proportion is different from 80%. So let's see what the true probability was. It was 80%, right? So I actually made the right decision. And I'll tell you, sometimes I make the right decision on these, and sometimes I make the wrong decision. That's why we have those type one and type two errors. All right, let's get a new shooter. Let's try this one more time. Let's see, oh, that's no good. Oh, Ooh. that's not looking good. Yeah, I'm gonna reject unless some miracle happens. Yeah, there's no miracle happening. So you can see this sample proportions at 50%. That is so far off of 80%. I'm not even interested in the rest of these shots. So let him get up there. Okay, so you can see there's a huge gap, right? Null proportion was allegedly 80%. I'm seeing a sample proportion of 52%. So I'm going to reject the null. And I, I, would, I just want to reiterate, I, I've mentioned this before, I personally prefer confidence intervals, and I'm going to show you why, or explain why. If I rejected the null, all I would report at the end of this, step 13, would say, because our p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null, we have evidence that the true proportion of free throws the player makes is not 80%. So all I've told you is what it's not. It's just not 80%. What I like about confidence intervals is it tells you what the proportion is and here's what I mean by that let's go back let me clear all of this all right let's go to 
a one sample proportion z interval. I know we could run the test, but let's run the interval just in, in, instead. So this time we made 26 out of 50. And let me go with a confidence level of 95%, the industry standard, and hit calculate. So this tells you not only is the proportion not 80%, it tells you it's between 38 and 66. So why I prefer confidence intervals is because it tells you what the proportion is right, it is between 38 and 66, where all the hypothesis told, test told me was it's just not 80%. I get so much more information in a confidence interval. Again, I'm gonna reject the null. I'm definitely gonna reject it. All right, and just based off this sample proportion, I think the player's true proportion, I think the green line's gonna either be at the 50 or 55 level. Um, so let's see, what was the true probability? It was, oh, I was wrong, it was at the 45, okay. Right, which is also possible, a gap of seven. So this guy on this day was actually overshooting his true probability by 7%, but it was definitely way off from what was claimed. All right, so again, I hope that helps with p-values, right? P-values, the probability of getting the results you did, the results from your sample data, just through chance, just through random variation, given that the null is true. All right, thanks guys, bye.